Hello everybody and welcome back for another episode. Today we're going to be talking a little bit more about stained glass, colored glass, and uh, pick up on the conversation we had about two videos ago. And what we're looking at here on the screen is just supposedly the first example of a stained glass window. And it's associated with St. Paul's Monastery in the UK. And I believe it was in 1973 that during excavations, they unearthed this blue, green, gold, uh, and yellow pieces of um, colored glass, basically. And they didn't exactly know how to reassemble them, so they just compiled them into collages, which you can view to this day. But I kind of tend to think this was more in line with what was in these religious structures as opposed to the stained glass with the depictions that we see today. So I wanted to go back into our history and just see if there's any other things we can kind of dig up related to colored glass, stained glass. And I came across some interesting articles, one talking about the weird 19th century belief about the magical healing powers of the color blue. And it supposedly centers around one individual individual called Augustus Pleasanton in 1877 and apparently he became convinced that blue light led to healthier plants and livestock and that started this blue glass craze and at one point a company in Massachusetts was making 3,000 square feet of blue glass a day or so they say. Now this character Augustus Pleasanton he served, so we're told, in the American Civil War, and he wrote this book on the topic of blue glass, and he got a patent uh, with the United States Patent Office. But the story goes that he built this grapery uh, in the 24th Ward of the city of Philadelphia, and it was arranged with a unique pattern of blue glass and transparent glass and the claims were that this promoted growth uh, more so than just your typical transparent glass so this was apparently a craze and but this concept uh, so he wrote a book in 1876 detailing all his findings but this whole concept of uh, a craze a fad associated with one individual who wrote a book like I've seen this script before and I remember when I was looking into the octagon house craze of again the 1800s 19th century it has very similar mo to it and it was this architectural fad that swept through the US and Canada and it was also spurred by a book by this one individual Orson Fowler so it seems to me I think it's just a mechanism that they use to explain away a greater phenomena. So they just pick one individual, okay, you're the guy, you created, you, you there, here's a book, and that started this whole phenomena, and then it sort of just all goes away, and it's a good way to sort of just explain away whole phenomenons, you know, movements, but in my opinion. But uh, also when looking at this octagon house craze, Thousands of these geometric oddities were built by the time the trend it hit its peak in the 1860s. And I added this here. Uh, it's a good thing there wasn't any um, anything internal strife going on in the country like a civil war. <laughs> so you get this octagon craze. They're building thousands of these structures, these octagon houses, you know, in the midst of <laughs> the American Civil War. I guess all those uh, orphans on those orphan trains were building these things, but just ridiculous. But uh, so, yeah, I think that's this is just one of their many tools they use to explain things away. But going back here, uh, kind of we're going to try and steer back to stained glass, but we've got to talk about Sutro Baths real quick. And it was constructed according to the narrative in 1896. Uh, and, and it had, I believe, six indoor pools. Uh, sorry, seven indoor pools. I think six of them were salt water. It might have been more functional than 
than just a place of recreation. And when you look at the infrastructure, you know, the materials used, you're talking 100,000 square feet of, of glass, 600 tons of iron, a lot of lumber, and a lot of concrete. And it just seems a bit much for the time. And uh, so the narrative seems, it seems questionable. And when you look at some more images of this place, it's just, it's unbelievable in, in its scope, and especially for that time. And there's some interesting photos for its construction, some pretty convincing ones actually. So I'm wondering maybe if the age of photography is a bit earlier uh, than, than we're told, because we know they hold back technologies and they've been, by the time we, we actually get technologies, they've already been around for 20 years. Uh, or longer, so I'm thinking the controllers maybe withheld that, and maybe they built this structure, but for a different purpose. And the the ruins of this place can still be seen today, but I think uh, some people speculated that this could be a wastewater treatment facility. And when you kind of look at another uh, former sewage pumping station, Cross Ness in the UK. Uh, it's got a very similar look to it with the peaked roofs and just the general layout and this I believe uh, on the right here is a cooling pond and you've got some interesting bodies of water right next to this structure and this is uh, Sutro Baths on the left by the way so there's some basic similarities and I, I saw this on an article I'll link to on that was on Stolen History on their website but even the look of some of these pools, um, some of these saltwater pools on the inside of Sutro Bass look like clarifying pools, uh, which they come in a couple different uh, shapes. One is rectangular. So kind of have the same look to them. And I remember just a side note, I was looking in my amusement park series, I was looking at this place called Woodward's Gardens and this thing, this place, it was, uh, it had a conservatory, slash uh, museum, slash auto, uh, zoo, slash aquarium, as well as being an amusement park, apparently. And you look at some of the structures that were in this amusement park, these gardens, and it's just this w interesting Moorish architecture, but in the behind or yeah, I think it was, no, sorry, in the front of one of, of this particular Moorish structure, there was this interesting ride called the Rotary Boat. And um, I'm questioning if it was an actual ride or if it served a different function. And before we get into that, I just wanted to mention, yeah, between 1849 and 51, San Francisco was entirely, almost entirely destroyed by fire seven times. So you had the... the the city go up in flames seven times and then so between 1851 and 1866 with the civil war going on in the 1860s you just still decide to build this amusement park slash gardens you know it's just it seems a bit much but getting back to this this ride called the rotary boat when you look at this it looks like a clarifier and a clarifier is just generally used to remove solid particulates or suspended solids from liquid for clarification and they're widely used for wastewater treatment and in the bottom right here here's just a clarifier that's uh, again they can be rectangular circular but this is one that's empty and kind of looks like this rotary boat so it makes more sense that it would be functional as opposed to being an amusement park ride in my view, but something to consider. So, but when you go and do continued research into Sutro baths, you find that according to visitors reports, a great deal of the structure was made from stained glass. And on the right here, you can see some of this stained glass and we've got a zoomed in image, a part of that image. and. This was from 1966, and there's not much of the stained glass left at this point, but 
you can kind of see that uh, you have different colors here. And so if this place was actually functional for a different purpose as opposed to just being a place of recreation, then you know things get interesting as far as this stained glass. And so I wanted to see if there was other instances of stained glass that I could find in the 1800s and I, I ran across or came across Hot Springs National Park and in this particular national park there's 92 sites of uh, excavations happening but they're also digging up the remains of hotels and bathhouses from the 1800s and this is there was this place called Bathhouse Row and you had all these bathhouses which were um, I guess they were destroyed and built on top of and this is just a photo that of, of one of them called uh, Lamar bathhouse but they did excavations and uh, they pulled out these glass fragments again more colored glass so that's kind of interesting and speaking to this uh, this uh, hot springs national park what I find interesting about this national park it contains uh, a portion of this city called Hot Springs, Arkansas. A portion of this city is contained within this national park. <laughs> and it's the portion with the, as mentioned, with the uh, these bathhouses, which is it, that are, and all these excavations that are happening. So, you know, whenever I kind of hear the term UNESCO World Heritage Site or National Park, I'm kind of assuming hidden history at this point. But yeah, so national parks usually make us think of pristine landscapes. Uh, and most of the 58 national parks in the United States fit that mold, but there are a few exceptions and this Hot Springs National Park is one of them. And I guess it's the country's smallest national park. But yeah, it contains a part of this city here where uh, they're doing these excavations. So just just a point of interest but this whole topic of uh, chromotherapy it's a science of using colors to adjust body vibrations to frequencies that result in health and harmony and Wikipedia weighs in here they say chromotherapy is an alternative medicine method which is considered pseudoscience so the, you know they definitely want to let us know there's nothing nothing to any of this but there are things uh, there's something called red light therapy, which I guess goes by another term, photobiomodulation. But if you look into the history of red light therapy, I think it was in 1903, there was this person, Niels Finson. He won the Nobel Prize using some of this uh, red light therapy. To, I think he successfully treated lupus and smallpox. So there's... There's a little substance to to some of this, um, to some of these therapies and with these different uh, wavelengths, so of the visible light spectrum. So I, I think there's a little something more to this. But we move on here. If you look at also grow lights, uh, light emitting diodes. You know you've got these. They have these different colored LEDs, and they found that plants obviously they. They respond to specific wavelengths associated with different colors and so the theory is if you can you know isolate these different wavelengths which respond to the different colors of the visible light spectrum you're going to get more growth and even if you mix and match these different wavelengths you can affect plant shape as well as growth so there's a whole science to this but uh, so that's just one application but even on the uh, in in the invisible light spectrum just outside of the visible light spectrum you've also got ultraviolet light which is broken down into three uh, sections a b and c uv a b and c uva it would be like black light uvb would be what gives you like a, a sunburn and uvc is effective in killing uh, bacteria uh, Wyoming considers switch to UV light to kill wastewater bacteria. So a lot of applications to 
light both visible and invisible so just wanted to uh, reference some of that and that's going to lead us to talking about this place which I kind of find fascinating it's called the Broadwater Hotel and Natatorium and it is located in Helena Montana and it was we're told constructed in 1889 now the population of Helena Montana in 1890 was just a little under 14,000 but this you have this structure in the middle of nowhere and uh, it's located in western Montana and it sits about two miles outside of the city but um, really interesting place and uh, just the look of it it's kind of I haven't seen anything quite like this but it is Moorish uh, a Moorishly de uh, designed structure and this is probably what, probably one of my favorite images I wish it was a little uh, clearer but these windows you're just wondering what is going on with all these windows on this place and of course you know we got the antenna sticking up definitely not flagpoles but interesting structure you know really interesting structure and again it's in the middle of nowhere you know we're going to talk about it a little bit more but here's just another image a little clearer just these windows are I'm, I'm thinking these are functional and we're just trying to figure out what that function is exactly but there's also another bathhouse of a Moorish design turn of the century called uh, Ocean Park Bathhouse in California and it also had domes and antenna and it had some interesting symbolism on it with uh, the crescent moons and the five-pointed star but outside of that what I also wanted to mention here is just some more images. I think a couple of these we've already looked at, but the city was getting almost all of its water supply from a place called uh, the Ten Mile Creek, and it was being diverted to the city, and this is that water supply running right next to this structure. Just thought I'd mention it, but again, these windows are just crazy on this structure. Really interesting. I've never quite seen anything like that and I just wanted to mention that there was a man-made little lake here thermal lake also known as Lake Wilder the lake was formed by diverting water from this 10 mile creek just something to note and they had a trolley that dropped people off right to the front of this place and you can see these windows in the background but I found a, a nice uh, image here showing some more of these windows and just look at this one right here unbelievable like what's the point of all these things and even in this particular uh, in, in this window within these different these circular forms here you could see what appeared to be smaller windows or at least that's kind of what it appears like so just very interesting and when you I kind of got I've got another image here showing the front of the structure and I just uh, imposed this cathedral on top of this uh, image here but you know we see this same pattern and design on these cathedrals and if you look at the architectural style for this structure it is Norman and Gothic and this Broadwater Natatorium is Moorish so the idea that this is tied to a specific style it doesn't apply and uh, so that leads me to question is it just aesthetics or is it functional or is it um, symbolic even possibly so all three of those things something to consider but when you look at the inside of this place stained glass windows ring the pool and rows of high windows admitted light to the interior colorful tiles covered the floors and walls and there were apparently a hundred steamed heating dressing rooms so again stained glass comes into the picture and when you look at these photos uh, of the of the windows on the interior uh, these things are just unreal you got octagon windows on the inside I don't think I've ever seen that 
and now that I know we got all this stained glass, now I don't know exactly which windows contain the stained glass, maybe all of them, I don't know, but when you add that to the mix, I'm, I'm leaning towards there's a functional element to this, and here again, here's just a nice uh, crisp image showing some of these interesting windows and even these ones up top here and what I should mention too is this structure this pool I think it was 300 feet by 100 feet one of the largest pools in the world uh, for the time but it was fed by a hot springs and in the last video I talk about how the, the cathedrals a lot of the cathedrals are built on top of old Roman baths or what we're told are Roman baths in those Roman baths, a lot of them are fed by hot springs as well. So just something to note. But what else I want to point out, if you look at the outside again of that stru of this structure, the windows are circular. But on the inside, those same windows are octagonal. <laughs> that really like got me thinking these are functional. Like I don't I don't know. I'm sure there are other examples of this, but I have I have not come across it. And just the look of these things, and it, I'm thinking there's a, they're doing something, amplifying sunlight, doing something, stained glass. I don't know how it all works or ties in, but it's it's a possibility, I believe. Interesting stuff, and really close to this this natatorium. There are, there's this, uh, these greenhouses, uh, the cons a conservatory as well. It's called the State Nursery and Seed Company. We're told it was built right around the same time. Now, we're told that first it supplied just, uh, it supplied cut flowers and plants to the city of Helena. But then they expanded to grasses, grains, and vegetables that would thrive in Montana's rigorous climate. So part of me is just wondering, did the controllers actually build these structures to stimulate growth in these areas? You know, get get the different grains of vegetables, and I don't know what they would be doing with the, the natatorium, but just something to consider. These, but I think these structures are, it's they're tied together potentially, and this idea. Uh, so we looked here at this these greenhouses, conservatories, and, and they're close to, to this, uh, this, these baths, this natatorium. In the last video, I talked about this place called the Piedmont Baths. Again, another bath, but uh, next to it, there's also a conservatory as well, a greenhouse called Oakland Conservatory. And it had a really interesting, uh, above the entrance, just really interesting design. So this again, similar pattern. Just so I'm just I'm just uh, kind of questioning it, and uh, I find it interesting. But again, the 19th century was the golden age of conservatory building. There is just so many things that uh, the 1800s was the golden age of a lot of things. But so just something to consider. I just wanted to point that out, and I think I will leave it here. But uh, there's a couple video updates I want to get to, so let's jump in. Okay, so today we've got two updates I'd like to talk about, and one is in relation to those golf courses again. In, in the video called The Fall of Rome, we talked about this uh, trend of building dilapidated structures in the 1700s. <laughs> And when you look at a lot of these, they're also called follies. When you look at them, uh, usually, or sometimes, they're surrounded or next to golf courses. And we pointed that out. And then in this video called What Lies Beneath, we were talking about how uh, on this former former World, World Fair site, there's a golf course, and it just so happens they built... Uh, or they buried a, uh, a this Ferris wheel and an axle, a giant axle. 
So they, we kind of suspect they're hiding our history by putting golf courses in, in over top of things that are buried. So after that last video, I got a couple comments and they were basically alluding to the fact that the military has a lot of golf courses. And here's just two of these uh, comments, Money Penny one Thank you for sharing. I too think that the golf courses are a convenient way to keep things undercover, especially when there are golf courses on military bases all over the world. And I think uh, there was also a suggestion to check latitude and longitude of these sites. So thank you for that. And also the United States military owns and operates over a hundred golf courses. Crystal, Matt, Crystal Mystic 11. Keep up the great content, bro. <laughs> Thank you. But so good tips. So when you look into it, you find the Defense Department operates 234 golf courses in the world, draining millions from the U.S. budget. And this is just a, a map of the Pentagon's 234 golf courses. Now, some of them aren't actually shown here, like there's golf courses in, I believe, uh, Japan and South Korea, just to name a few. But uh, the sport is directly linked to U.S. military culture. There are 234 golf courses spread across the over 800 U.S. military installations located around the globe. So just kind of considering, like looking at these follies that we mentioned and how they seem to be next to golf courses and the speculation is they're hiding other ruins by putting golf courses uh, on top of them and um, also the World Fair things being buried now so that's why I think it's pretty interesting that of all the sports to be closely linked to the military it's golf and uh, I'm gonna guess that there's probably some of our histories hidden in these military golf courses as well. So thanks for the feedback and the comments. And I just wanted to bring you that. So that's my first update. And the second update is just uh, in this last video here, What Lies Beneath. We uh, showed this map of long lost Oakland. And I wanted to show you a couple of before and after photos or images just so uh, you can kind of see how things have um, uh, progressed or regressed in some cases. So the first thing we're going to look at is this Oakland Observatory circa, it, I guess it was established or constructed in 1883 and here's what it looked like and in the background this is supposed to be like an amusement park this castle looking structure but it's just interesting, you know, when you take a look at the roads or lack thereof, it's just, it's rubbish. Yet, you've got an observatory and, and a castle, basically, in the background. It's just this weird dichotomy, but... So, but, uh, yeah, so now it is a green space, Lafayette Square. So that's not too bad, uh, but this next example is a little egregious. Uh, Alameda County Courthouse. 1875 and I mean it's got the decorative iron well, what they'll tell us is decorative iron crusting you know the same style that we've seen over and over again in a time where again uh, horse and buggy but you know disregarding all that it is now a Z hotel <laughs> a Z hotel so you go from this to this. This is what progress looks like. What a travesty that one is. But also breweries. If you look like there's so many breweries like in the middle of the 1800s and even up to the 1900s and I think some of this stuff is just repurposed older structures and this is uh, the o Oakland Brewing and Malting, Malting Company circa 1907 for some reason, they decided it should look like a castle. And here's uh, here's sort of the before. Again, the roads, just total state of disrepair. But here's what it is now. And 
it's just amazing how how much transformation has happened and but when you kind of see the before and after it just really uh, sinks in so i think uh that's about it for today uh, last thing i just wanted to mention i finally set up a paypal so if anyone is feeling like donating there is a link in the description so thanks again and i guess i'll leave it here for today and until next time take care